What's going on, guys? Mad Lab here. We have another UFC pay-per-view uh, pay card. This is the last one of the year. Um, we're coming off a very long slate last week. Um, 15 fights, I believe it was. Uh, the card was actually really, really good. You give... Um, I, I shouldn't even say it. I said it in the beginning, but I said you give me a little bit of better fight than Stephen Thompson and, and, and Holland, and you have a really good pay-per-view card. Um, but that fight turned out to be an epic, epic fight. I mean, I, I don't think anyone expected it to be that way. Uh, I think there was a lot of uh, details involved in that fight that made it that way, the stylistic matchup uh, and stuff. But when you really look at that fight, before we jump into this car, when you really look at that fight, um, people were kind of holding on to the fact that Stephen Wonderboy Thompson was, you know, uh, 39 years old. Um, you know, he's at the tail end of his career. He hasn't really looked good. Um, he's fighting a guy in Kevin Holland who's been shouting from mountaintops that he wanted to fight a striker. And I was telling you guys over and over and over again that it's it's not the fact that Kevin Holland's not a good fighter because he's a very good fighter. He's a very but he's more of an entertainer than he is a fighter. So the people that were kind of holding on to him and saying, well, look, this is what, what's going to happen here. Um, you know, he's going to come out. He's probably going to take him down. He's got good jujitsu when it's on the ground. Uh, we know that Stephen Thompson does not want to be on the ground. Um, for those that really held on to that, really don't know Kevin Holland. Um, Kevin Holland is not going to go in there on a, on a main event spot and take a fight to the floor when all he did was complain anytime he fought a guy who took him to the ground. He was going to stand up. He was going to make this an entertaining fight. He asked for a stand-up fighter. The problem with that was another thing I was screaming from out. I was screaming from Mount Tops is give him a striker. That's fine. But you're giving him probably one of the most disciplined strikers we've seen in a decade. Um, and the thing with Wonder Boy is he was born and raised in a point fighting system. Um, and what I mean by that is he's not a guy that's really going to come out and really put it on you and knock you out, even though he looked phenomenal against Kevin Holland. He really, like, pushed the, pushed the envelope. Um, but this is a guy who understands range. He understands in and out. He's been doing this since he was a kid, you know, coached by his father, still coached by his father. Um, and that's a tough riddle to solve, you know, because at that point in time, you got a guy in Kevin Holland who is an entertainer, who's going to look to get flashy, who's going to look to do these, these dynamic things. It's nothing that Wonder Boy has not seen before. He's not going to get rattled. He's not going to get baited into a firefight, even though he did get baited a little bit uh, in this fight. Um, there was a couple spots that made me a little uncomfortable uh, where Thompson was kind of really pushing it. Why he did that, I don't know. Maybe he was making a statement. He wanted to show everybody, yeah, I'm 39, but I still have that dog in me. He proved that he did. Um, kicks were amazing. Everything that he did was perfect outside of a few things that I saw that I didn't like. I felt like he was really fighting – um, to prove a point. And sometimes that's where mistakes can be made. But I mean, what a fight. What a what an absolute war that was. It was a, just a, a, a great, great fight. I was not expecting a fight like that. I was expecting Wonder Boy to win like a boring fight, maybe like three to two, uh, maybe four to one. Um, but I was not expecting a war like that. And I mean, if I know it's not going to happen and I know that people think that, all right, well, you know, um, is Wonder Boy at a point now where he could really dial in and make a run? Maybe, yeah, sure. But to me, and I tweeted this out, a perfect opportunity, uh, and I just see a perfect landscape for him to kind of walk away. I mean, even though that sounds premature because of the showing that you did see, um, but I mean, if this guy left tomorrow off of a performance like that, uh, we're always going to remember, and that's where the water cooler talk. That's that's where all that stuff comes out like five years down the road. What if, what if, what if? And that's the beautiful thing about combat sports, the, the whole what if scenarios. What if Muhammad Ali fought Tyson? What if this one fought that one? What if, it, you know, so he could have really left us with a what if scenario. Um, not gonna. He's going to continue to fight. He's already said he's going to continue to fight. I, I, I love it. I want to see him fight. But that to me at 39 years old was a performance for the ages that he could literally just walk away and leave question marks in everybody's mind. So, I mean, great card overall. It was a fun card. There was a couple ups and downs in the card, a couple situations where Michael Johnson really, really impressed me. Uh, Michael Johnson, you know, we kind of look for him to disappoint us. Uh, he's burned me a lot in the past. He comes out in the first round. You kind of, he's he wins the first round. We go to the refrigerator. We're like, we got this in the bag. And then all of a sudden he loses. He did not do that. He did not do anything stupid. He fought a perfect fight. He ends up beating Mark Dye Casey. Mark Dye Casey was actually the one who did some stupid things. 
Um, Clay Guida, pit Clay Guida, we love that. Um, dog, I just didn't see Scott Holtzman, you know, bringing anything to the table that was going to really threaten Guida, his cardio, his pace. The only thing you got to worry about with Guida is obviously the, the submission threat because he does, you know, lead with his head. He is that, like, um, prototypical wrestler. Um, Jonathan Pearson Elkin fight, we knew that was going to go that way. Nathan Levy, good fight. Um, the uh, Nunez, the Nunez fight was actually a really good, good, good competitive fight until the end. Jack Hermansa was the one fight that it just confused me. I mean, it really, really, really confused me. You just, it was. I mean, listen, Delizze. a. I mean, props to him for for getting that calf slicer. I mean, that was just what a position to put somebody in. I don't know if you guys know what a calf slicer is, if you've ever felt the calf slicer, but it's agonizing. And when you're in a position like that, where he had the calf slicer on the top. Um, there's no way out. There was, as soon as he put it in, I was like, this, this is done. But he should have never been in that position. He was tagging him on the feet. He was owning him on the feet. Um, and as soon as he felt that the lead Zay's hips were loose and he could not really seal his hips down, he couldn't really stop that scramble, he should have just got up. I don't know why he was playing in his guard. I don't know why he was playing on the ground. You want to get him to the ground. It was a beautiful takedown. It was a beautiful entry. He, he secured it. But as soon as he realized that I can't pin Delize's hips down in this position, get back up, reset, maybe try it again. But there was no reason why he should have played around in his guard. He did as Delize was really climbing for things and looking for things. I knew something apparently was going to lock in. Um, I didn't know if it was going to actually lock in for the end of the fight, but I knew he was going to eventually seal onto something that was going to put him in a bad situation. Never thought it would be a calf slicer. Never thought it would be in a position like that. But that was just a complete, complete, brain lapse on um on Hermanson's fault so that was one that I just I didn't understand uh the Tiavasa and Pavlovich fight what do you got to say I mean we we know that Tiavasa's chin is granite um you got to start maybe questioning though like you got to see the next fight now can he take a shot like like he used to anymore or is this a situation where he has taken so many shots where his chin is starting to deteriorate or is Pavlovich really does he really hit that hard I mean, this guy came in and within seconds, I mean, dropped him and put him to the canvas and ended the fight. Um, Barbarina and DeSanjos, we knew that fight was going to go like that. Um, it was just a terrible matchup. I'm a huge advocate of Barbarina. I think he's tough as nails. But there was nothing in there outside of baiting RDA into a firefight that was going to win him that fight. Um, the Angela Hill to Cody fight, uh, another one that I was pretty high on Angela Hill. Um, you know, you look at Emily Ducote, she's a good fighter. She's a prospect. She's got a lot to learn. She doesn't really have the resume and you're going to make her a favorite against someone like Angela Hill, who, when she's dialed in, she's completely dialed in. Uh, when she finds that flow state, it's very hard to beat her. And she found that flow state and she won. Um, other, overall, the card was a good card. It was a very entertaining card. There was, there was some very high points, some very low points, uh, from a DraftKings perspective. Um, when you have this many fights on a card, it's very, very hard to really dial in the optimum lineup. Um, you know, I personally like the smaller cards. Sometimes when you're even down to 10, 10 fights on the card, it gives you a little bit of more. You may get a couple more ties here and there, but on a card like this, it was very volatile. It's the end of the year. Contracts are, you know, are up. They need to service the contracts. They got guys that are against the wall. They want to trim the fat. You know, two fight losing streaks. They want to, you know, get somebody pushed out, start new on the new year. So there was a lot of guys that were really fighting for their jobs. There were guys that were ending their contracts. There was just a lot of volatility on this card. Fun card. I mean, I, I mean, it was a really fun card. Uh, I don't know if I could say the same about this card. Do I think this is a pay per view worthy card? Probably not. Uh, there's a couple good fights on the card. Uh, the main, uh, the main card is pretty good. The card is not bad. I'm not going to say the card is bad, but I consider this more of a um, a free card. I don't consider this a pay-per-view card. Uh, maybe if you gave this one more really, really good fight, uh, we have a pay-per-view card here, but I think they're leading on like the whole Patty Pimlet thing. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, look, you got Darren Till, Duplessis, you got Ponzinibbio, Morano, you got Bryce Mitchell, Taporia, which is actually a good fight, but <clears throat> it's not a pay-per-view uh, you know, caliber um, fight. I mean, on a main card, yeah. But I mean, Jan and Ankalaev to me is not a pay per view worthy top tier fight. Uh, it's just not. But this is what we got. We're gonna break them down. I got some um, some interesting tidbits on on some of these fights that I do want to go over with you, and I just want to kind of give you guys a opportunity to make your own decision and just be smart and 
kind of not follow the masses so much and not get baited into um, the whole uh, um, recency buys and stuff, like what happened with the Emily with the Cody fight. Everybody was all over her. They were shitting on Angela Hill. Everybody was on Kevin Holland. They were kind of shitting on, you know, Stephen Wonderboard Thompson. So it's like you don't want to get baited into that. You kind of want to kind of formulate all like your own opinion you know, on things. And um, the way you do that is really dive in. You take the people that you enjoy listening to and maybe you take tidbits from what they do and then you go and you do your own research and you formulate your own opinion. One thing that I do over at the MadLabMMA.com, if you ever go into the Discord, there are plenty of times where my subscribers will go against me. Um, You know, Showdown Christine, that's her dog play of the week. There's probably 70% of the time when she picks a dog, I'm against it. Uh, I like that. I like the friction. I like the the um, the uh, the independent the independent stands. I don't want people to sit there and say, "Well, you know, Mad Lab says that this person's going to win, so this person has to win." I want you guys to argue with me. I want you guys to not go against me, like just to go against me. But I want you really to formulate your own opinion. And if you agree with me, great. And if you see something and I don't, that's great too. Um, you know, uh, in our discord, there's no egos. Uh, I'm sure you guys that are listening to this now that are in there absolutely know that we all get along. We're like one big family. They actually check in on each other all the time. We're watching football in there, which we're doing really well with. We're watching, um, you know, all sports. Sometimes people are in there talking about movies and stuff like that. So it's just a really, really great community. I hope you guys will definitely come out and join us. Um, this, the year is over. Uh, we are going to be throwing some stuff for the new year. Um, but if you guys want to jump in before that and you want to see some uh, some fights with us and you want to get my full breakdowns, my full DFS, my hedge weights, um, Air Force One does all the uh, the metrics. Uh, we got a private pod. We obviously got the private community. We have um, a live stream right before the fight. Uh, then we're in Discord all night sweating fights and just doing our thing with DraftKings and wagering. So I, I hope you guys will join us www.themadlabmma.com. I have no idea why I just said www. Nobody says that anymore, but I did. It shows my age. Um, all right, so let's jump right in here. We're going to go to the first fight of the night. We're going to go Jan Blahovich and Ankalov. This, obviously, fight is, is not one that I'm really looking forward to. But I will tell you this, guys, right out of the game. We're going to spend a little time here. Um, and I'm going to do some research. This is kind of awkward as you guys see i'm at uh, i'm at my house right now i'm not at the office uh so i'm gonna dig in on the computer with you guys and we're gonna go over some things um you know see if we can find some new nuggets i haven't found already um so if you guys got any questions after the pod you can drop them in the comment section and i will answer them um, when i see them um so when you look at this fight i'm gonna tell you guys right out of the gate if you guys bet ankle i have i think you're crazy not saying he's not going to win the fight, but there is no way, excuse me, that Angoliev should be sitting at a minus 280, almost a three to one odds in this fight. I think it's ludicrous that he's that his odds are this high. Now, you're going to see people pulling the trigger on Angoliev. You're going to see people putting units on Angoliev. You're going to see people flooding Angoliev on, on, on DraftKings. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, recently bias. And a lot of people think that maybe Jan doesn't deserve to be where he is right now. And, you know, a lot of people think that, and me for one, I'm, I'm not going to lie. When Jan did have the belt, I always thought that he was just a placeholder. Uh, I have a ton of respect for Jan. I think he's a, you know, Blahovich. I think he's a great fighter, um, high level grappler. He's got good power. He's, he's fought a very high level of competition, but a couple of his fights that you would say that he's getting a major credit for. You know, kind of certain ones fell his way and certain ones he had um, serious, um, you know, edges on. You look at the Rackage fight. It goes in his resume as a win. However, did he win that fight? Was it a competitive fight? Yeah, but did he win that fight? He won that fight on injury. You look at the Israel Adesanya fight. He kind of leans on that. The first guy to beat Izzy. It wasn't at 185. It was at 205. He beat Reyes. We're kind of questioning Reyes a little bit. But although he did fight Reyes when Reyes was Reyes. Uh, Jacare, Corey Anderson, Jimmy Manawa, Jared Cannonier. He fought some really good guys and he beat some really good guys. So whether he's good or not, Jan, whether you think he's good or not, Jan finds ways to win. Um, you know, his notable losses, if you really look at it, outside of one, outside of one loss, he lost to really good guys. He lost to Glover. He lost to Tiago Santos when Santos was a little bit younger. He lost to Cummins. That's the one questionable loss where you're like, all right, well, who really? And he lost to Alexander Gustafson. So the, the guys that he's lost to, like, 
in the UFC, they're 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 high level competition. You know, they're high level competition. Twenty nine and nine. He's six and one since his loss to Santos. You know, so when you really look at that, you're saying the guy's doing something right. Um, you know, he's really getting used to that five round experience. Um, he's finding the power in his hands, and it's more because he's starting to believe in this whole Polish power thing. Never before was Jan a couple of years ago talking about Polish power is real. All of a sudden now this is becoming like a thing, the marketing end of it, Polish power, and he's got crazy power in his hands. Does he have power? Yes, he's got power. But does he have this like overwhelming power that people are like, you know, you know what? You got to watch Jan's power. No, it's the de- set. It's deceiving power. It's not this like this, this, this game changing power. Uh, but he does have power. And when you believe in that and you buy into that and you and and, and you kind of sell yourself on that, there's something to be said about that. And he kind of sold himself on this whole Polish power narrative um, that he excuse me, that he uh, that he's now really buying into, even though he's a very high level grappler. He's a very good grappler, not from his back, more from top control. Um, you know, so the guy's dangerous. And there's something to be said about when you have a certain belief system in yourself. He's a super nice guy. He's a super humble guy. Uh, and he still really loves to fight. And he really believes in his heart that he is the top of the food chain, you know, that he's the top of the food chain. And there's something to be, do I think he is? No. Do you think he is? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But the fact of the matter is, is he believes that. And when you believe that there's something scary about that. He's not coming into this fight thinking that he's going to, going to lose. He's coming into this fight, really, really believing that he's going to win this fight. Um, and you do have to, I mean, everybody goes in with that belief system, but there's levels to that belief system. And Jan is the type of guy, almost like Patty Pimlet. If you watch Patty Pimlet's interview with Breck Okamoto, which Okamoto always does a fantastic job with his interviews. He's one of my favorite interviewers, to be honest with you. Um, he had this, he has this very um, scary confidence about him. Um, now, some of it can be an act um, and, and some of it isn't an act. With Jan, I don't think it's an act. I, I really, really don't. I think he really has this, this over like bearing confidence in himself that he really believes that nobody can beat him. Um, you know, and you could come out and you could say that publicly and you could say, you know, I'm this and that, but deep in your soul, nerves are real. Like if you walk into a cage or you walk into a fight or a street fight or any situation and you're not nervous at all, you're lying. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to people. Jan comes in with a, a nervous energy. Everybody comes in with a nervous energy, but he really, really is buy. He buys into himself. He's he's he will buy into himself before he buys into anything else. So there's something to be said about that. Now, when you look at Angolaya, this is he's coming in at minus two eighty. He's nine and zero since his last fight against Craig. Those of you guys who remember that fight, that was I, I don't even know what the fuck happened there. Um, but this is a guy who is destroying him from pillar to post. Uh, Paul Craig for three rounds and then at the very last second he locks up a triangle on him like Paul Craig always does but the thing that really bothered me about that fight was that he tapped extremely quick I mean unless he didn't know how much time was on the clock or his corner didn't do their job or he didn't hear him maybe because he was caught in the triangle um but you gotta kind of know you know where you know where you are you know where you are in the round where like what's going on like you just don't tap like that um, I'm not categorizing this now. Now don't, don't take me wrong. I'm not categorizing this as what Chuck Yalov's used to be when he would just, when sometimes he would give up. I'm not saying he gave up, but something told me like when he locked that triangle in on him, he just said, you know, it's locked in. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tap. There was no way he was going to sleep. It was way too quick. You're not going to sleep that quick from a triangle. He just kind of tapped. So my flags were up on him after that. Then he changed my mind quickly. I mean, he went 9-0 and in his last, you know, fights. Notable wins. Obviously, the only real notable win for me there is Anthony Smith. Um, Anthony Smith is my boy. I love Anthony Smith. Um, and he, he, he made quick work. I mean, he, he made Anthony Smith, you know, look regular, to be honest with you. Uh, another one was Santos. But Thiago Santos at that time, he was – kind of aging a little bit, you know, it's kind of fluctuating in his career. Uh, his notable loss, obviously, is Paul Craig. Now, when you look at this fight in a hole, um, where he deserves to be a minus 280 just kind of blows my mind. I, I don't get it. You know, you got a guy in, in Jan who um, he's fought a far level, better level of competition. 
He's going to have a three-inch reach advantage coming to this fight. Both of these guys are orthodox fighters, so it's not like they're a switch fighter or a southpaw. They're both orthodox. Uh, the strikes landed per minute are dead on even. Um, striking accuracy, dead on even. Striking absorbed, almost dead on even. The defense, almost dead on even. The only difference here is the takedowns. And it's kind of odd, but Jan is, is the leader in the doghouse by a very, very small margin. You know, he's a little bit over one where Uncle I have is under one. Uh, the takedown accuracy is 53% for Jan. And the takedown defense, the takedown accuracy for Ankalaev is 33%. Takedown defense, a little bit, you know, a little bit better for Ankalaev. You're looking at 85% to 66%. But then you go down and you're and you're saying, okay, well, where are all these these paths that he has and all these advantages that he has to make this a a fight where he he is this one a three to one? I mean, he's three to one. He's a three to one favorite. That's that's insane to me. He's beat Smith. He's beat Santos. He's beat Ozdemir. He's beat Krylov. He's beat Kutalaba twice. Some of these guys are are good, but he was kind of catching these guys at a at a at a point in their career where they were kind of we were questioning them. We were questioning Ozdemir here. We were questioning Santos. We were questioning Krylov. We always questioned Kutalaba, uh, but at that time, I think Kutalaba wasn't so much of a question mark at that time. So when he beat Kutalaba twice, I think we like everybody just sat back and said, "Well, if fucking he beat Kutalaba twice, Kutalaba's a fucking beast." And you know, so at that point in time, I don't think Kutalaba was being questioned as much as he is now. Now, Kutalaba fights, we kind of say, "Listen, I ain't fucking betting on him unless he's fighting a scrub." Krylov always a good fighter, but you know he's starting to come into his own again now. Back when he was when he fought Krylov, Ozdemir, we know what was going on with him. He's very hit or miss. Santos older. And then you got Anthony Smith. So he hasn't fought like these, these, these dogs where we're like, Jesus Christ, like this dude's fucking beating all these, these top level guys. You know, I, I, I dare to say that, that outside of Anthony Smith, Jan Blahovich is his best level of competition, you know, the best level of competition he's faced. So where I, where I see this three to one odds, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I think you guys would be foolish to bet this fight. On Ankalaev, if you got if you guys really believe Jan's going to win, I believe the value is on Jan. But I don't see any value in Ankalaev on a bet here. Um, I really, really don't. I'm going to pick him in this fight. Um, but the 9200 on DraftKings, the seven, you know, all the value is on Jan. Like if you know, when you play DraftKings, guys, you also got to remember it has nothing to do. Sure, you want the guy that you're picking to win, but there's got to be value. There's got to be value there, you know. So does Uncle I have, have value against Jan in a five round fight at 9200? Of course he does because he could finish the fight. Um, you know he could really put it on Jan, um, and and I'm probably thinking that if Uncle I have wins this fight, he's gonna he's gonna finish it. So there is value there, but the heavier value is on Jan in a five round fight. He's familiar with five rounds. He's been in the championship fights. He's been in the championship rounds. He's won the belt. He's won the better the better level of competition. You know, so you're looking at a guy at plus 235 and 7,000, a borderline punt play. There's major value on Jan, major value on him. Um, on Goliath, to me, there's zero value on the betting line, zero. I mean, if you're talking about being a, a, a long game wagerer, that's not a wager you take. I'm sorry, that's not. That's a very casual wager um, that you take because maybe you want to try to cushion your stats or you want to, you know, just – you know, whatever, but the, the ankle I have at minus 280 is not, is not a smart bet. I'm sorry, but that's not a smart bet. So if you take that bet, there's there, win or lose. It's just not a good bet. You know, when, when you're looking at wagering and you're looking at stuff, you got to kind of look for value. You know, uh, what's the difference in the ankle I have is minus 280 and minus 350. There's really no difference. Would you take them at minus 350? Right, an extra 60. If you you got to be really, really fucking confident in a guy to take him at minus 280. So minus 280, minus 300, minus 310, minus 325. It's kind of the same fucking thing. You take them because what's what's the big deal if you lose fucking, you know, $280 on one unit or you lose 325? It's the same fucking shit. Big deal. You lose a couple dollars extra. You know, so you really got to be confident in a guy at, 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 at almost a three to one odds. Are you really that confident that Uncle Iev is going to completely starch a former champion, a guy who's been in there with a ton of level of competition. Um, 
all that experience, all that wisdom, everything he has, like, are you, are you really willing to bet? Well, if you are, I don't think it's a smart bet. And I think a lot of very sharp people will agree with me on that. Um, so from a wagering perspective, I'm away. I stay away from this and I highly recommend, I highly recommend you guys stay away from this. I'm picking him to win. I'm picking out Goliath to win this fight, but I would not be shocked any way, shape or form. If Jan comes out, makes this a dog fight and wins this fight. So Take it for what it's worth. You guys ride it the way you want. I'm here to help you guys, uh, and that's what I do. Um, from a DraftKings perspective, you got, like I said, I'm glad I have 9,200. There's value there to an extent. I mean, you, you really got to go through the nuts and bolts of the card to um, uh, to see if that's really where you want to go in the 9,000 price range, um, you know, in a fight like this. But 9,200, if he does win the fight, I do believe that he's going to win inside the distance. Uh, I believe there's a situation where he can, can get on top of Jan. Jan tends to kind of um, accept position when he's on his back. I think that's a situation where Anklav can really lay some ground and pound. Um, you know, uh, so I do buy into that narrative that if he decides that I'm going to take this to the ground or he can reverse position and get on top of Jan early enough in the round, I think he could really put him on him and finish the fight. From a striking perspective, Jan, you know, I got to be honest with you. He's got a three-inch reach advantage. I think Anklav is obviously a better striker, but Jan's no slouch, man. Jan finds ways in. You know, he finds ways in. And if he gets a takedown on Ankalaev, he's tough on top. He's really, really, really hard to deal with once he gets top control. So if Jan ends up getting top control, I mean, look at Izzy. Izzy's got a great get-up game. Izzy's got a great get-up game. 205, 185, whatever weight you want to put it at. You know, he's got he's got a very good get up game and he had a lot of trouble maneuvering his hips and, and trying to get out from under. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I know there was a big weight discrepancy. I do understand that. But when you can't bust your hips loose, depending on where you get taken down in the cage, if you get taken down near the cage, you can kind of wall walk. You got situations. But depending where Jan takes him down, how clean his entry is. Uh, where he lands on top, if he can somehow get some sort of semblance of side control, uh, you know, try to move his way to mount. He's not an easy guy to get off you. Jan's got a very good top game. So, you know, I, I see paths for both of these guys to win inside the distance. Um, so there's value on both sides. I just see more value on Jan. Um, but I am picking on Goliath here, um, and I'll probably pick on Goliath inside the distance. Um, but this is definitely – you know, a no bet. This is like a dog and pass situation from a wagering perspective. Next fight, you got Patty Pimlet minus 250, Gordon plus 210. Another fight, I don't feel that Patty Pimlet should be minus 250. Um, 19 and three, I know he's getting a lot of shine with, um, with, uh, with Barstool, uh, and all that, but you know, Barstool can't go in and fight the fight for him. We've, we saw that with Molly McCann. Molly McCann was getting a ton of shine, uh, with Barstool and a lot of attention and stuff like that. And, you know, how did that work out for it? Didn't, it didn't, excuse me, it didn't work out too well, you know? So um, I'm not saying that Patty's, I mean, uh, Molly's nearly on Patty's level, um, but this is a kid who still has things to prove. I mean, he's proved his game. He proved he can make the weight. He proved no matter where his weight goes, he'll figure out a way to get in there. He proved that he's got this crazy amount of confidence. He'll slug with you. He'll grapple with you. He'll go anywhere you want the fight to go. Um, and he will, um, he will fight there. And that's entertaining. And the kid can fight. I mean, the kid can absolutely fight. It was kind of funny to me when he fought Van Germini and there were so many people on Van Germini. Um, and then when Van Germini rocked him, it was like, oh, you know, everyone's like, ah, you know, he's going to lose. He's the next fight. He's garbage. This and that. Well, he showed everybody he's not garbage. The kid is a good fighter. Problem with him is the level of competition that he's faced. He, he beat Van Germini. He beat Vargas. He beat Jordan Levitt. I mean, who did he really beat? You know, you look at a guy like Jared Gordon, brown belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu under John Danaher. Now, when you look at um, Jared Gordon, what do you say to yourself? All right, he's a brown belt, but he's a brown belt under John Danaher, and that means a lot. Those of you that are not really versed with the grappling community or those of you that maybe are, uh, but not really from the New York, you know, area, um, John Danaher is one of the most brilliant minds of Brazilian jiu-jitsu that we've ever seen. Um, this is a guy who trained under Henzo Gracie. This is a guy who brought the leg lock game into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, like really brought it to the forefront. Uh, he's got a certain way that his mind moves. Um, he's very philosophical. He's very uh, analytical. 
uh, and when he came into the, you know, when he came into fruition with this whole thing, he took the whole Hensel Gracie style and he said, well, why does everybody worry about the waist up? Why is everybody ignoring the two biggest extremities on the body, which are the legs? So he took everything that Henzo taught him and he started really injecting this, this leg game in, into play. And um, he's got some of the best grapplers in the world under him. You know, um, Gordon Ryan. Um, I mean, the, you know, he had the death squad. Uh, you know, so this is a guy who really is, is completely dialed in to kinetics, to the anatomy, to hit in a certain flow state, to just really reading, you know, the puzzle. He understands the puzzle, not from the waist up, from the head down to the feet. And if you're a brown belt under Danaher, you're a black belt almost anywhere else. You know, you know, providing like certain, you know, there's guys like Eddie Bravo and stuff like that, but you're a black belt under Danaher. I mean, you're a brown belt under Danaher and you're a black belt in a lot of other places. So Jared Gordon is a very good grappler. After all that to be said, he's only got two wins by submission in the UFC in 11 fights. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Take that back. He's got two wins by submission. In 11 fights in the UFC, he's got zero, which you kind of find odd, right? Like, this is a guy that Lab just said he's got this crazy, um, you know, pedigree behind him and stuff like that. But he's got, in 11 fights, he's got no submissions. He's got no submissions uh, in, in the UFC in 11 fights. Four losses are all by finish. He's been submitted. He's been knocked out. Um, 19 and five, he's obviously got more knockouts than he does submission on his resume. He's a tough fighter. He's a good, good fighter. Uh, very seasoned. Uh, he showed that he's got good. He, this guy overcame addictions. He overcame a lot of demons in his life. Um, and he really turned the tables and he turned out to be a really good fighter. This dude is a solid, solid fighter. He's not a great fighter. He's not an elite fighter, but he's a very, very solid fighter. And he's actually a great test for Pimlet. Now, you got to wonder how's Pimlet can handle this. This is a guy who can knock you out. This is a guy who is unchained. This is a guy who, you know, will grapple with you. Um, but I would be remiss to think that Patty Pimlet um, may not get neutralized on the ground with somebody like Gordon. Because I'm not saying Gordon is going to be this crazy offensive grappler. <clears throat> you know, because if he was, he would have more submissions under his belt. And he also has been submitted, but Gordon can do enough with his with his with his pedigree to really kind of stay safe and kind of keep the fight in a in a, in a wrestling situation that makes him more comfortable, where he kind of has the weight distribution, where he kind of has the the top control, where you know he can kind of keep the fight in a, in, a, in a certain state and make make Pimlet chase him. Now, if you go into the the, the stats here, let's take a peek. I like doing it this way, guys. We do it kind of together, even though I, I did it. So you got uh, Pimla, who's going to have a longer reach advantage. So he's a 73 to 68. So he's really going to, you know, Gordon's really going to have to find his way underneath. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to have to use that like Joe Frazier type style where he's coming underneath and he's putting hands on him and trying to find that tunnel. Uh, but he's going to have to find ways. He's going to try to create angles. He's got to try to do certain things to kind of keep him lit off. And that's not Jared Gordon's game. He's not the type of guy that's going to jump off the center line and create these angles and set these traps. He's that's not his style. He's more of a rugged, come forward, you know, uh, style. You throw hands, I throw hands. Both of these guys are orthodox fighters, so nothing, nothing is going to really uh, switch. If you look at strikes landed per minute, it's kind of skewed because of the landscape of Patty Pimlet. You got to remember that Jared Gordon has eleven fights in the UFC. Patty Pimlet has three. You know, some of them ended very quickly, so it's a very small sample size. But you do have Jared Gordon. Um, almost hitting six strikes uh, to Pimlet hit four. Both of them's accuracy is pretty much the same. Strike absorbed is pretty much the same. Defense, Jared Gordon is a little bit better. Obviously, Patty Pimlet is there to be hit. Uh, the takedown average is almost identical. Takedown accuracy, almost identical. Takedown defense, almost identical. Um, submission average on Pimlet is 4.7 to Gordon zero. So, you know, I think this is a really tough test for for Pimlet, but I do see him winning the fight. However, uh, we're going to learn a lot about Pimlet in this fight. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about him in this fight. Um, and minus two fifty to me is is a no go for me. I'm not willing to lay minus two fifty on Patty Pimlet. Um, I'm not willing to lay minus two fifty on any fighter who is fighting someone that is their toughest test. So it's not a it's not an indictment on Patty. It's not a 
um, I, that I don't think he's good. But when you have a guy that is fighting his toughest test, this is his next step up. So you really don't know. It's a test. Why would you bet minus 250 on a test? If he was fighting somebody that, you know, he was at this level, at a certain level, and we saw this big overall body of work from him in the UFC, and we were like, all right, well, he beat this guy, beat this guy. Why shouldn't? That's a different story. This is a test. I'm not willing to bet minus 250 on a test. Um, I'm not, you know, there, there is there value on Gordon at plus 210 if you think he wins? Yeah, sure there is. But um, it's a fight that I'm overall going to just stay away from, um, from, from, a, from a betting perspective. From a DraftKings perspective, you have Patty at 9,100. You have Jared Gordon at 7,100. You know, the thing with Patty is, is he really going to be able to come out there and put on this 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 clinic on Gordon? Uh, is he going to be able to finish him quick? Uh, is he going to be able to take him down and, and really just make Gordon's grappling use, useless? I don't know if I really buy into that. You know, I don't know if I really buy into that. I know the UFC would love for that to happen. I know his crowd and his fans would love to, for that to happen, but I don't know if I could buy into that. Gordon is game. And the thing that, that that concerns me with Gordon a little bit is that he all four of his losses in the UFC have been by finish. So can he be finished? Or the chances of him being finished in this fight, um, uh, high probability if he loses, well, the numbers show that it's 100% possible. So, um, you know, that's where that 9,100 tag becomes enticing because you've got a guy in Patty Pimlet who's very volatile. He does unchain things. He'll jump for flying submissions, do all these fucking crazy things uh, to get you out of there. And even though Gordon is more disciplined, more honed in, more calculated, more experienced, you still can get caught up in the moment. You still can get caught up in these things saying, I'm going to teach this youngster a lesson. And then the youngster teaches you a lesson. So. Um, very dangerous fight. I would not be shocked in any way, shape, or form uh, if Gordon wins this fight. Um, and I wouldn't be shocked if Patty ends up finishing him by submission or a uh, knockout. I would say probably more lines that he he would knock him out. I'd be really impressed if, if, if um, Patty submits him here, even though that's a big proponent of his game, uh, which is also possible. But I'm going to go Patty Pimley here. I'm staying away from this fight from a betting perspective. But from a DraftKings perspective, I'm going to have a little bit of both. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of Patty. I'm probably going to back off of Patty a little bit because uh, I do think that Gordon can drag this into deeper waters. And as this fight goes into deeper waters, um, obviously the, the the price tag starts to drop and the value starts to drop on a $9,100 fighter, especially if it's a good fight, especially if Gordon puts him in a situation where now he's grappling defensively or Gordon takes him down and maybe for the half of the round, he just has this boring labored wet blanket top control on him and that just takes away scoring from patty so i'm going to back off of patty a little bit i'm going to be on gordon a little bit um um i'm not going to adjust my 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 um my shares on gordon higher because i'm bringing myself down on patty a little bit um but i will have some of gordon and i will have some of patty i'm not going to have any high percentage of either guy here uh, next fight, Morono plus 155, Ponzinibbio minus 180. I do think that this fight is probably where it should be. This is the first fight out of, out of the card so far that I see that the line is probably right. Um, and people may disagree with me. People may think that it should be closer. People may think it should be a little bit wider. But I think this is about right where it is. Um, if you really look at this fight and you look at the past two fights, this line is much more realistic than the top two we just discussed. Much more. There, I mean, you have Ponzinibbio at minus 180 against a, a dog in Morono. Dog. The kid's an absolute little dog. Um, and then you got minus 280 against a former champion and minus 250 against a guy who is his biggest test. So you tell me which line out of the three is the most realistic. The Ponzinibbio line is the most realistic. So it's 8,700 for Ponzinibbio, 7,500 for Morono. I think that could be a little closer. I think that could be a little closer, to be honest with you. I'd like to see that a little bit more like 84, 8,500. I think that could be a little bit closer. 8,700, 7,500. It's fair. It's not, It's not. you know, anything where I'm looking at it. I'm like, wow, like this is clear value. Um, it's fair. I think that's fair. I think it definitely should be a little closer. I'd like to see that at 8,500, not 87. Um, but that's what they left us with. So why that uh, price? I checked it about an hour ago and it wasn't there. So now it's there. Um, so when you look at, when you look at this fight, um, in its entirety, let me jump into the stats here. 
So you got Pazingu who's got a one inch reach there. Both of these guys are orthodox fighters. They're both kind of throwing at the same clip, five five strikes. Uh, striking actually is pretty identical. Uh, striking absorb, Ponzinibbio takes a little bit more damage. Uh, the defense, Ponzinibbio is a, a hairline better. Takedown average, kind of the same, less than one. Uh, takedown accuracy, both of them are terrible. Takedown defense, both of them are middle of the road. So, you know, this is another fight where when you look at the numbers and you look at how they match up, it's it's, it's pretty similar. But when you look at a guy like Morano, this is a guy who wins off you know, this kid's a great grappler. I mean, he's, he's like, people look at him like, like he's not, not an athletic guy. He's kind of goofy looking. Um, you don't really talk about him too much, but the kid wins. Like the kid wins, like he wins, you know? And if you look at um, his overall body of work, um, this is a kid who he won his last four um, after losing to Anthony Pettis, um, beat Cerrone, Beat Zawada, beat Gold, beat Semmersberger. Semmersberger to me and Cerrone to me were the two impressive ones. Uh, Zawada and Gaul, I could take them and leave them. Now, if you look at his losses, you know, he lost to Anthony Pettis. He got, you know, Chaos Williams, all right, whatever. But the two guys that he lost to a while ago, back then they meant something. You know, Nakamura was a really good fighter back in the day. He was like one of those solid guys. He wasn't like an elite guy, but he was a solid guy. Nakamura was a really good fighter. Uh, and Jordan Mean back in the day was supposed to be something like, you know, he he never really panned out. But Jordan Mean was supposed to be a really, really good fighter. Um, so he, he he never lost to scrubs like the, the, the guys that he lost to. They were they were good, legitimate guys. Um, the guys that he beat, some of them were OK. Some of them were over the hill. Some of them were just tough guys like him. So he doesn't have this like this, this red, the resume that's like blowing your, your 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 mind off. But the kid is a good fighter. You know, the kid is a really good fight. He's a second degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu um, over uh, under Magalhães. Um, and he just comes to fight. He brings his, his, his lunchbox every day into that cage. Uh, he's not going to wow you with this crazy athletic ability. He's not going to wow you with flying triangles or these crazy entries. Or he just, he's a very straightforward fighter. You know what you're going to get from him. You just got to beat him. Now, when you look at somebody like Ponzinibbio on the flip side, this is a guy who at one point in time, Pons was the, the, the fucking man. I mean, he was on, you know, he lost to Lorenz Larkin back in 2015. Then after that, he went on a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fight win streak, beat Neil Magny, Mike Perry, Gunnar Nelson, Nordin Taleb, Zach Cummings, Court McGee. I mean, he beat some really, really fucking good dudes, um, you know, um, and tough guys. Then he comes back and he loses to the leech. Now, that was um, his, his re-entrance into the UFC. Um, and I remember when he came back, um, he took a break from 2018 to 2021. And I remember he came back and people really shit on him for that fight. They really, really did. They shit on, um, on Ponzinibbio for that fight. They thought he was washed. Why did he come back? And I didn't look at it that way. I looked at it as this is a guy who's been out of the cage for, you know, three years. Um, obviously, he there was uh, nervousness involved. There was emotion involved. There was... Um, the cage rust involved, which I, you guys know that I'm a firm believer of. You can't predicate one showing like that. You got to let him get in the game. It's almost like the 49ers uh, this week with uh, Brock Purdy. They asked Brock about, um, you know, how he felt when his number was called. And he goes, look, I'm always prepared. He's like, but I was very nervous in the beginning until I took that hit. Once I took that first hit, I felt like I was in the game and everything was good. Ponzinibbio needed that in that fight against the Leech. He needed like that three years off. He needed to come in. He needed to get scarred up. Unfortunately, he ended up getting clipped and he ended up getting knocked out. But people just wrote him off. I mean, people just said like, he's done. He's 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 done. So when he came back against M Miguel Baez, everybody was all over him. And I refused to go against him. I said, he's too good. Um, he's got too much of a resume. He's too talented. He, he went in there and he took an L. Uh, on his three-year comeback. So we put a, a pretty decent bet on Ponzinibbio, and he ended up winning a really good fight. It was a really fun fight. Comes back after that, loses to Jeff Neal, uses, loses to Michelle Pieta. Now, both of those were split decisions. Both of those were split decisions, So, which means that one judge sees it a little bit one other way. Those are his fights. So technically, he could really be on a three-fight win streak opposed to a two-fight losing streak. Um, you know, so...
you know, I'm looking at this. When, when I look at this, you look at the last time he's been knocked out since the Legion. It was 2015. Now, when you're tentative and you're nervous and, and stuff like that, then obviously the punches that knock you out are the ones that you don't see coming. You know, and that's what kind of I'm, I'm gauging the reason why he got knocked out by the link, uh, by the leech, you know, coming back. He is a durable dude. He's a tough dude. He's got, you know, very, very good, um, a very well-rounded game. He's got good striking. I mean, his cardio can be a little bit better, but it's there. Uh, I just see him edging Morono everywhere in this fight a little bit. Uh, I think Morono can bring that dog out, like, and he could really, like, make things difficult for Ponzinibbio. And if Ponzinibbio does make a mistake – Ponzinibbio does start losing steam, or if we're in a really close fight, a 1-1 going into the third, uh, and Ponzinibbio kind of just looks like he's a little lackluster, I could see Morono pushing through the other side of that tunnel. I could totally see that. And maybe another, we have another split decision, and it either goes Ponzinibbio's way or it goes Morono's way. But when you're looking skill for skill, when you're looking at the talent level, when you're looking at the resume, when you're looking at all these other all these factors involved, the way they match up, it's really hard not to pick Ponzinibbio here. You know, it's really hard not to pick him here. So um, from athletic ability, from everything, the only thing that I will say about Alex Morono is you're not going to find many other fighters that have that kind of dog. I mean, there's there's guys like Darren Elkins and stuff, but Alex Morono will really fight until he's he's gone. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you got to knock him out. You got to finish him because he's going to continue to fight. Um, so I, I respect him. I think he's a really good fighter, but I think that what carries him is his ability to – push forward and to jump into that fire and not fear, um, you know, that, 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 um, that war, um, where Ponzinibbio, he doesn't fear it either, but sometimes he gets, he falls in love with it a little bit too much and he can be, you know, a little hittable. So, uh, I'm going to go Ponzinibbio here. I'm not sure if he's going to finish Morano. I could see him finishing Morano, but I'm not sure if he's going to, um, yeah, I'm probably going to Ponzinibbio by decision, maybe even split decision. But I do think he wins this fight. I'm, I'm not going to say split decision. I'm going to say Ponzinibbio by a pretty comfortable decision. Uh, that's what I'm going to say. I just think he's going to edge him in, in, in these certain spots. So minus 180, I do not mind that. Uh, as far as the, the, the $8,700 price tag, that's really on you if you really think that he's going to finish him. $8,700, Morona is going to bring the fight to him. He's going to make him fight. So Ponzinibbio is going to have to throw volume. He's going to have to keep up in the numbers. He's going to have to show the judges that, you know, um, his, 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 uh, his striking is a little bit more voluminous, a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more damaging. Um, you're going to have to, you know, uh, and there is going to be the possibility that Ponzinibbio can absolutely finish him. Um, would I be shocked if Alex Morono finishes Ponzinibbio? Not necessarily. I mean, not necessarily. I've seen Morano do some some really interesting things, but um, I would say that would be one of the farther th things away from my mind when it comes to if there was a finish. I think if there was a finish, it'd be on Ponzinibbio's side. If there was a split decision, I think we could really be sweating that one out. Um, but I do think Ponzinibbio is going to win the decision, a, co a pretty comfortable one. So I don't. I, I think it's a little pricey. I think Ponzinibbio is a little bit pricey. I think there is value on Morono just because of the style that he fights. Uh, but I'm going to go Pons. I'm going to have some of Pons for that, you know, finishing upside. Uh, but I'm also going to have some uh, of Moreno. Um, next fight: Duplessis minus 180 until plus 155. Now, I am sure. I'm. I'm not. I mean, I'm positive. I'm 1,000 percent positive. I am going to catch some major shit for this. Now, Duplessis is minus 180, Tills plus 155. DraftKings prices is 8,800 to 7,400. Uh, Duplessis, two inch reach advantage. Uh, he's a switch fighter. He's got one takedown per fight, has only two and three fights, though. So it's not like he's his takedown machine. Got Darren Till, lost four of his last five. Who do you, what are his last five fights? Lost to Brunson. Horrible matchup for him. Wrestling. Lost to Whitaker. Whitaker's a horrible matchup for anybody. He beat Kelvin Gaston. He lost to Masvidal. He lost it to, he got, he got caught by Tyron Woodley. Um, he, he lost to all really good guys. I mean, you can make the argument if Masvidal is really good or he just went on that kind of little bit of a run. But um, he lost to really good guys. Brunson, Whitaker, Masvidal, Woodley. Say what you want about Woodley. But at one time, Woodley was the champ. And at one time, Woodley was very hard to beat. So 
you can say what you want about him. He's, he's a scrub. He, yeah, maybe he is now. But back in the day, Woodley was a very, very reputable welterweight uh, champion. So when you look at this fight and you look at the, who has Duplessis beat, he's beat Brad Tavares, Trevin Giles, Marcus Perez. Um, who's the best one out of them? Tavares. Is Tavares a great fighter? No, but Tavares is a durable fighter. Tavares is the type of guy, he's very polished. He's got good striking. He's got that dog in him. He's going to continue to come forward. He's very hard to knock out. Um, so that's a fight where I would I gave him credit for. You, you beat Brad Tavares. You look at Darren Till, 74-inch reach advantage. Duplessis got 76, which is kind of strange, right? Because if you look at Darren Till, he looks like a really big, big, um, uh, <clears throat> really big dude. You know, he's got that wide back. Um, he's just very, very unchained, um, you know, with his fighting style. And he's not, he's not the type of guy that's going to come out and throw hands. He has to make sure that what he's throwing means something. And that is not being unchained. So I take that back. Um, he's very chained in his approach. Uh, and the thing with him is he's so dialed into his, his, his striking that everything he throws, he wants to count. And sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's bad. That's good because you're you're kind of conserving your energy and stuff, but it's also bad because you're really relying on that kill shot. And if you don't get that kill shot and somebody's throwing a little bit more volume or you know he's being a little bit more active, that looks terrible in the in the in the eyes of the judge. Um, in in the eyes of the judges. So he's a southpaw. You got Duplessis a switch fight. If you look at the striking numbers, it shows right here. You have 6.55 for Duplessis, 2.26 for Darren Till. Um, accuracy, about the same. Uh, strike is absorbed, 3.02, 4.23. Um, uh, defense, about even. Takedowns, you have the Plessis at 1.2. Darren Till ain't going to fucking look for a takedown to save his life. Takedown accuracy, the Plessis is only 18%. Darren Till, who cares? Uh, takedown defense, Darren Till 78%. I would say that's a little skewed. Uh, I don't think his takedown defense is that good. Uh, Duplessis at 100%. So when you look at this, you're saying to yourself, all right, well, you know, Darren Till never panned out to be what he was. I was one of the guys, and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to admit this right now on this show. I was one of the guys, because I come from a striking background, uh, that I saw something different in Darren Till. Um, I saw this certain somatotype that he had. He had that like old throwback body, he had the wide shoulders that generates power. Um, and there was something about him that I really, really like. And I was kind of buying into him a little bit early. So I'm, I'm being one thing about me. I'll be very transparent. And I remember I forgot who he fought, but I wrote this long fucking breakdown about, you know, his, his how he generates power and what parts of his muscular structure allows him to generate power and how he swivels his, his, his feet when he punches and how just very mechanical he was. And if he built on that, you're looking at a possible future champion. The problem is he's never built on that. He just never did. Now, I don't know what he's been doing on his downtime. I don't know if training with Shemaev has been this, this big uh, epiphany to him. I really don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. But what I will tell you is that I'm not going to give up on him until this fight is over. Um, I still do think he can be a contender. Uh, I still do think that he has a, a, a certain talent about him. He has a certain charisma about him. He's, 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 there's a certain way about him. My issue with him is I think that he bought into himself a little bit too much. Um, I really do. When he's getting on the microphone, he's screaming, and I'll take on anybody. And all of a sudden, like, he became this comic on, on social media and Twitter and all this. It's like his, his whole demeanor changed. He went from this real hungry, hungry lion to this, like, comic, this comedian. You know, so I think he's I think he's even got like veneers now or something. But um, where does he want to be? Because this is it. He comes in and he has a horrible showing here. Then like this is it. This is his time now. He's coming back. He's going to show this new, you know, Darren Till, this new and improved Darren Till. Um, you know, um, if he has a really good showing here, if he has a really good showing here, the Darren Till story starts all over again. It starts all over again. If he ends up getting starched, the Darren Till story is dead. But if he has a really, really good showing here, the Darren Till story will start all over again. Um, so it's it's uh, 
man, I'm going to go back to where I was on this. I'm going to go back to where I was on this. And I'm going to not erase what he's done in the past because you can't do that. But I'm going to stick to what I thought about him in the past. And I'm going to hope that he 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 kind of just produced a little bit more, just kind of produced a little bit more, uh, resonated with himself and, and really honed in the skills that he needs to hone in. Go back and watch the film. Where did I make mistakes? Where did I, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? He did a lot more wrong than he did right. But if he's got the right team behind him and he really does have the ability that I think he did have, you could be looking at a pretty decent fighter. So I'm going to go down until here. I'm going to go down until here. I'm going to put my faith in him one last time. Um, and I'm going to take Till. And I hope he doesn't make me look like an asshole. I'm sure 99.9% .9 of everybody's going to go on Duplessis here, but I'm going to go on Darren Till. I'm not going to, this is the, this is the fight where I either keep my faith in him possibly being a contender or me completely misreading this. Um, so let's go till. Let's go till. I think the 8,800 price tag is not valid for Duplessis here. Um, if he's going to strike with till, um, I think he's going to really, really have to find a way in. I mean, I, I know he's going to have the reach advantage here, but I think he's really going to have to find a way in. I don't think Till is going to play that real high volatile game. Like I said, he picks and chooses his spots. He makes sure he, his punches count. He doesn't throw volume. He doesn't throw. He doesn't He doesn't leave a lot of room uh, for you to capitalize. You really got to catch him. You know, the reason why Woodley was able to catch him is because, uh, you know, there's a, there's something, or, or Masvidal, there's something to be said about when you charge in and you kind of clear that space quick. You know, those real explosive fighters can clear that range and clear that space. I don't see Duplessis being that guy. If you're going to stay in toe-to-toe -to -toe with Till, um, I think Till can, can, can chew you up. So we're going to see what happens. But I'm going to go down to Till here. I think there is value on Till. I think there's more value on Till. There it is, there it is Duplessis. I would definitely say this is a dog or pass situation. Um, and let's go down to Till. Don't make an asshole out of me. Uh, okay, last fight we're going to break down here is Bryce Mitchell and Illy Laporia. Um, what a fight. I think I'm still a little torn on this fight, to be honest with you. Um, you have, you know, Bryce Mitchell, who, who, this is a kid who his grappling is just insane. I mean, hey, look at his wins. Barboza, Feely, Rosa, Sales, Moffitt, like he's, the kids, what, what, what a fighter. The problem with him is his getting it to the ground is his biggest issue. Um, you know, he's got a 50, uh, 50 percent. So, you know, take down accuracy, his take down defense isn't that good, but who fucking cares? Take him to the ground, be my guest. Um, you know, uh, when you look at their striking differentials, you're looking at, you know, um, both of them are hitting around, you know, three, three strikes, striking accuracy. Bryce Mitchell's a little bit cleaner, um, striking absorbed. Um, a little Laporia takes a little bit more. Um, takedowns we went through that man what a fucking fight how do you pick this fight guys this is a fight where honestly it's really really like it's really hard to pick you know it's this is a really really tough uh, fight for me to pick um there's something about bryce mitchell that he finds ways to win um and there's something about illa laporia that just seems like he's the better fighter um what a tough fight i am gonna put my faith let me see. I'm going to take Bryce Mitchell. I'm going to take Bryce Mitchell here. I'm looking at the draft games. You got 78%. I mean, 7,800 Bryce Mitchell. You have uh, 8,400 for Toporia. I think this is a really close fight, but I think this is going to be all predicated on if Bryce Mitchell can get this to the ground. The odds here right now are uh, minus 160 uh, or minus one. Is this right? This can't be right. It's so weird because I can't find it's showing up at minus 160. I don't know, but who knows? Um, I think this is a really close fight, but I think this is going to be all predicated if Bryce Mitchell can get this to the ground. I think he knows that. The only thing that scares me about Bryce Mitchell is he's really buying into this. Um, he's really buying into this whole conspiracy theory thing, and he's like really spending a lot of time on politics and stuff and that does scare me with this fight where Illaporia seems like he's just in there to fight um 
but you can't take away the talent of Bryce Mitchell. I mean, this is a guy who I know people kind of shit on Charles Rosa, right? But this is a guy who's a black belt on the Ricardo Laborio. And you guys know what a fucking, like, Ricardo Laborio to me is very, very high level, high on the food chain when it comes to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And he just doesn't hand black belts out to people. So when you got a guy like Bryce Mitchell that completely just out fucking grapples um, um, Charles Rose and makes him look like a white belt, something to be said about that. Something to be said about a kid who puts somebody in a twister. Something to be said about that. Um, this kid, the way he beat Barboza, um, who was a striker now, mind you, you know, but he's got to find a way to get this fight to the ground. He's got to find a way to get this fight to the ground. If he gets this fight to the ground, I think he's the better grappler than Taporia. It's if he can't get this fight to the ground, I think Taporia puts it on him. So I'm going to put my faith in Bryce Mitchell here. I would not be shocked in any way, shape or form. Who wins this fight? I would not put money on this fight in any way, shape, or form. If you want to look for a prop, I'm going to look for props. If there's a prop that I see, I will fire it off um, in on my website at themadlabmma.com. But I'm leaving this one alone. This is one I want to watch and I want to have fun with. And if you guys were smart from a DraftKings perspective, I would probably split this one in half. I really would. I would split this one in half. Um, if you want to lean towards the fighter that you like a little bit more, great. But this is a fight from a DraftKings perspective you have to slice in half because this is a fight where I could see these guys going balls to the wall for fucking three rounds. You know, um, just crazy transitions, somebody getting knocked down, getting, you know, pulling someone else in guard. A lot of ebbs and flows in this fight I can see. Uh, and then, you know, possibly the real fucking filthy split decision or somebody – capitalizing and getting a finish. So this is a fight that you definitely want to target. It's kind of mid-range. It's kind of nicely priced. And you know that their styles are going to bring the best out of each other. So definitely a fight you want to target. You want to split this in half. And from a gambling perspective, I'll completely stay away from it. Um, and that's pretty much it. So that's it for the show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to check out all of our content, go to the madlabmma.com. Uh, you'll get full breakdowns on these fights that I broke down, every other fight on the card. Uh, we also do NFL. We do... Um, we have the discords running for everything live stream before the fight. Um, we have uh, the, 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 the fighter, every fighter metric, uh, the DraftKings breakdowns, the hedge weights, wagers, everything that you guys need uh, to pretty much just capitalize on every slate. Um, and um, we like to think we do a really good job. So thanks for joining me and I will see you next week. <laughs>